I'm going to be honest with you. I'm always, actually, I'm always pretty honest with you guys. As I was putting this week's sermon together, the question that I kept coming up with was, at what cost? At what cost? At what cost will we choose to do almost anything? At what cost will we choose to, I don't know, go to the gym? What do we cut out? What do we choose to pay? What do we choose to do? At what cost will we choose to, um, I don't know, go and get our nails done? Um, we'll choose to cut, cut out a certain amount of time. At what cost will I choose to go to my barber? My barber takes one hour to do my hair. One hour. Um, that's not normal, um, but my barber's really good, and um, I know that if I have on a good haircut, good beard trim, lineup, I know it's going to cost me a certain amount of money and one hour out of my day away from my family. At what cost will you sign up to maybe for your kids to play a sport? You know, okay, it's going to cost me, it depends upon what sport, it depends upon how old they are, it could cost you one practice a week and one Saturday morning game, it could cost you every single day dropping your kids off and then games across the country. At what cost? You see, we all are paying costs for different things. And so this Sunday, as I was preparing my sermon and asking myself, at what cost, the, the real question that I was asking is, Jeremiah, at what cost will you choose to follow the Lord? At what cost? And as I was putting the sermon together, I called Mark in. I'm, I've, I've studied, I've read, I've looked things up into like different, the language of the original. I've read commentaries and I, Mark was in my office and we were talking about, I don't even know, the Suns game, who knows. Um, that ruined, let's not talk about it, okay. And I said, Mark, this is one of those sermons that I, I just sort of feel like I need to preach from my heart. And he said, then you need to do that. So today I don't I have a few points, and, but I'm really going to share with you what I feel the Lord is calling us to do as, as people. Let's pray, and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, you are a good God, and you do good things, and you love us, and you care for us. You're patient, and you're kind, and you're gentle. Yet you're strong, and you're straight to the point. Jesus, you don't mince words. You tell us as it is. And Lord, you challenge us not to sit on the bench, but to get into the game. So Jesus, I ask that today, this morning, that you would call us off of our rear ends and into life. Jesus, may we live this life as you call us to. May we enter into this adventure. Jesus, you don't just want us to live a life. You want us to experience abundant life in you. Jesus, I ask that you would move in churches all over the valley today. Lord, that it wouldn't just be us, but it would be your people at CCB. It'd be, it'd be your people at Calvary. It would be your people at Desert Springs. It would be your people at Palm Valley. And Jesus, I pray that you would do a move here at City View like you have never done before. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we looked at the followers, Jesus' followers, his 12, specifically his 12 disciples, the 12 men that followed Jesus. And this, as we continue our study and our look at the book of Mark, and this part is, this part of our look at the book of Mark is no ordinary followers. The followers weren't just those who followed Jesus then, but it's those who choose to follow Jesus now. Because he's called us to live no ordinary life. It's actually pretty extraordinary. It's pretty amazing but it's also not meant to be comfortable. We all like comfortable. Last night I watched the Phoenix Suns get comfortable after the first quarter, and then I watched them fall apart the second and third quarter, and then I watched them play with a panic in the fourth quarter. You can't do that in life. But so many of us do. 
I, I heard a pastor say, it, it seems like older people, as they get older, and, and he was just being funny, but he says, we read, they read the Bible in a panic like they're cramming for a test. But what if we lived for Jesus every day because we are dependent on him? Jesus has called us to live no ordinary life. No ordinary life. We're in Mark chapter 8, if you would turn with me to Mark chapter 8, verse 27. And Jesus here, he, he is, he's, he's got his disciples around him, and, and he's speaking to this group of 12, the followers, that, the, the specifically right now, to just the small group of his followers. And it says, Jesus went out, verse 27, along with his disciples to the villages of, Caesar, to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, And on the way, he questioned his disciples, saying to them, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, saying, Well, some say you're John the Baptist, and others say you're Elijah, but some say you you are one of the prophets of old. So this Jesus goes to these men, and he says, Okay, guys, who do people think that I am? He, he's trying to get them to ask some questions and to start thinking about things. Do you ever have that person? you have that person in your life that asks you the deeper questions? Laramie, we were at this marriage conference this weekend, and, and we, it was really good, super encouraging. And the, the, the speakers asked questions, and Laramie, like, they asked, the questions were pretty, like, shallow, but Laramie takes it to, like, the 10th level deep. And I go, honey, I... I am just trying to figure out today, not like, I'm not going, I can't even go that deep right now, but that's like immediately where she went. She's like, boo, and I'm like, uh, she's like, what's your biggest fear right now? I'm like, uh, what am I going to eat for lunch? Is my headache going to come back? Uh, No, I'm kidding. Um, But Jesus in this section of, in the section of scripture we're looking at today, he asks four huge questions. And the first question he says, who do people say that I am? He says, okay guys, who, who do people say? And, and one guy's like, well, some say you're John the Baptist, risen from the dead. He's like, well, that doesn't make sense, does it? Because John was my cousin, and we both walked around together at the same time. So that doesn't make a lot of sense. And they're like, oh yeah, that's probably true. He goes, who else? Well, Elijah, okay. The prophet, and if you look in other books like Matthew and Mark and, Luke and John, or Matthew, John, and Luke, um, if some say that maybe you were one of the prophets, maybe Jeremiah, and they start throwing out all these names of who he might be. You know, I, th- I think for many of us, maybe our question to us is, who, who, do, who, who do people in our circles, when we tell them we go to church and we tell them we're Christians, what do people think about Jesus? What do your friends think about Jesus? And, and you know, some of us, we come from this perspective, I want people to figure out life on their own. I want people, people need to figure those things out on their own. Like, I, I want, that, that's great and all, but how many of you have kids, and you don't want them to figure out crossing the street on their own? You, you know that there's a truth behind crossing the street. You know that it's a life or death situation crossing the street. I think this is one of those things that we want people to know the truth. And so Jesus then comes to them after he asks them that question. He says, okay, who do people say that I am? And then verses 29 and 30, Jesus says this. Okay, guys. And he continued by questioning them, but who do you? Who do you say that I am? Who am I to you? Who do you say that I am? That's Jesus' second question. And Peter answers and says to him, says to him, you are the Christ. And Jesus warned them. And and he told them not to tell anyone. Now that's an interesting thing. Jesus had a whole plan on how he was going to sort of let the world know who he was. In, In other passages, in other books, After Peter says, well, you are the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus says, you did not figure this out on your own, but God spoke this to you. So my next question then is, who do you say that Jesus is? Who, Who is Jesus to you? 
Is he just fire insurance? Is he just a good guy? I have a slide behind me. You know, I, th- I think for some of us, w- w- Jesus is either a good guy, he was a good teacher, he was nice, he did some, Jesus was either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. He can't just be a good guy. He can't just be a nice guy. Jesus said crazy things. Jesus said that he is the Son of God. Jesus said, I am the only way, the truth, and the life. Nobody can get to heaven except through me. Jesus spoke of God as his Father. Jesus is calling God his Father. Jesus has this relationship with God that nobody has seen. Jesus could heal and cure and do amazing things. Jesus can't just be a good guy, a good teacher, and a nice guy. He made claims about himself that makes him either a liar, a lunatic, meaning a crazy man, or he is who he said he is, meaning Lord. You see, I could hope my kids will figure it out. Or I could teach them now what's true. I don't hope my kids will figure out, hey, you know what, it's good to look both ways before you cross the street. That, I just know as an adult, you have to look both ways before you cross the street. Because my parents taught me, look both ways before you cross the street. It's a simple truth, right? I'm not like, I don't want to control who my kids are. I don't want to control my friends. I don't. He claims to be the Savior of the world. He claims to be the resurrection and the life. He claims to be the bread of life. Jesus, in John, he says, I am. That's what he, he gives himself that name. And when he says, I am that I am, he says, that means I'm God. There's no middle, there's no like, okay, well, I guess Jesus could just be a good guy. No, you see, when Peter makes the statement, you are the Messiah, you are the Savior of the world, Peter's making this huge, huge statement about who he is. So it's at this point that people have to decide, okay, is Jesus who he said he is, or is he just a nice guy? And for all of us in this room, we have to agree, and we have to sort of sit and think, okay, who is Jesus to me? As I sit here right now in the pew, who is he to me? You have to make that decision. Remember, As that slide said, he can't be what's on your left without also being the first two things in the quote by C.S. Lewis. If to you he's just a good guy, a good teacher, and a nice guy, then you know what? He's a liar and a lunatic too. I'm sorry, but then that's who you're choosing to follow, a liar and a lunatic. But if he is everything he says he is on the right... And that means he's your savior. That means he's your life changer. That means he's your provider. And so much more. So it's at this statement that Jesus, he says this, and Peter makes this huge statement, and Peter says, yes, you are. And, and then Jesus says, okay, guys, with that, he says, here's what it means for me to be the savior of your soul. Verse 31, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days he will rise again. So this is news to them. They're like, wait a minute, you're going to die? You're going to die? You're not supposed to die. You're supposed to come in and be our conquering king. You're supposed to get rid of Rome. You're supposed to do all this. And Jesus says, no, 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 Savior means I die. I have to die for your sins. And it says, and he was stating the matter plainly, and Peter took him aside. Peter goes, hey, Jesus, come on. You know, I just spoke God's word to you. Any of you guys ever get sort of super cocky because you did one thing right? And then you think you'll be able to do everything right afterwards, sort of like the first quarter yesterday? Um, I might refer to that. It hurts. I don't know how many of you are so hurting this morning. 
we'll have a counseling session over here later on. We can pray. Um, Because we need that. We need comfort for our soul today. Maybe Tuesday too. Um, But Peter thinks he he knows it. He thinks he's got it figured out. He's like, you know, God wants to speak to me. Maybe God wants to speak to me now. He says, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Yo, hey, fellas. I got to speak into Jesus' life real quick. Remember, Peter's the cocky guy. Peter's the guy that just sort of speaks the truth. Peter's the guy that just sort of goes out and he's the spokesman. Peter's just sort of that bulldog. Peter's that guy that thinks he's got it all together, has all the answers. So he goes, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Come here. You know, puts his arm around him, turns him around. You you know that time? You know that where that friend does that to you? I, I mean, I don't know if girls do that. I don't know if girls like maybe hold hands and they look at you in the eye and they're like, hey, let me tell you, sister. Or whatever you say to girls, I don't know what you say. Guys, that's what guys do. They just sort of put their arm around the dude and they turn him away from the crowd. And when they're getting ready to like speak into this, I'm picturing Peter. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke Jesus. Oh, man. Jesus. You don't rebuke Jesus. But you know what I love? I love that Peter felt free to do that. Because how many of you have ever rebuked Jesus? Because life didn't go as you thought it should. Anybody? Am I the only one who's done that? I did that this week. We, let, we were getting ready to go on a, tr- we were getting ready to go to a pastor's and wives retreat. And it seems like any time, l- just Larry and I try to get away, any time something happens. We've had two previous trips where it was just going to be Laramie and I get canceled because either a kid gets sick, the snowstorm of 2020 that closed everything in the world, or was that this year? It was this year, 21. What in the world? Seems, this year seems like it's already been like a year long. Um, and so Laramie starts not feeling good. And she's like, I should, when we're going to be around, it's a pastor's conference and there's we're pretty young in the pastor world, um, so most of the people are more mature than I am. Um, so she's like, I should probably go and get tested just to make sure that it's nothing crazy. And I'm like, God, I was mad. I rebuked the Lord. I've been where Peter is. I've been in that spot where I'm frustrated, and I'm like, God, this isn't fair. Peter's not saying about anything fair. Peter actually thinks he's just speaking truth into Jesus' life. And he turned around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter. And he says, get behind me, Satan. Oh, uncomfortable, right? Peter's like, Jesus, Peter takes Jesus. He says, Jesus, you're not going to die. And Peter goes, you're trying to get in my way, Satan. You're trying to get in my way. So Jesus quiets Peter. Jesus is telling them what he must do as the Messiah. Jesus is telling his disciples what he must do when he makes these claims. When Peter says, you are the Christ, the Savior of the world, Jesus says, as that person, yes, that's who I am, and as that person, I must suffer and I must die. As that person, that is a true statement, Peter, but with that, comes this weight. With that comes this responsibility. I don't know how many of you ever applied for a job and you look at it and, and they're like, hey, you're going to make this amount of money and it's this job and then all of a sudden you, you hear about the weight of the job, the responsibility of the job. You see, I, I, and each of you have that different weight, whatever it might be. And you have that burden that you're going to have to carry. And you have to decide, is it worth it? If you're a school teacher, the way it is, okay, not only, you know, you get to make no money, but you get to impact lives forever. You're like, oh, that's great. And then they go, well, you also need to buy the supplies for your classroom, which we're not going to reimburse you for, and you also are going to have to work overtime every single day of your entire life, which we're not going to pay you for, um, and all this. So you've got to decide, is the weight and burden worth it? When God said, Jesus, I want you to go die for the world, but here's the thing, you're going to have to suffer Is it worth it? So as Jesus tells his disciples, yes, I am the Messiah. This is the weight I am choosing to carry. Then Jesus is going to go talk to them about what it means to follow him. But what Jesus does is Jesus doesn't ask us to walk through something he hasn't already walked through. So 
So then he goes in telling them about what it means to follow. Verse 34 says, so he summoned the crowd. The crowd means anybody. People who believe in him or people who don't. People who are willing to give up everything for him and people who haven't quite decided who he is yet. He calls the crowd. That's the crowd. The crowd is every single person. It's not just believers. It is a crowd of people. So it says he calls the crowd with the disciples and he says some of the most strongest words found in Scripture. And he said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, if anyone wishes to follow me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Jesus is calling all of us to that life today. It means being uncomfortable that call to follow Jesus looks different for every single one of us. To, to, to the disciples, it meant giving up of their life and choosing to quit jobs, quit careers, everything to follow Jesus. That's the sum. Some of them, it was a matter of working in the, in the jobs or the fields that they, they worked in, but it was to live a different kind of life, a life that showed Jesus in everything that they did. Some of them, it meant giving up their weekends to follow Jesus around and do things. It meant giving up their evenings to go and help. We, we have ladies, there are ladies in Scripture that, that chose to go and follow and give all they had, all their investments, everything they had. You had all these different followers, but Jesus said, if you want to follow me, it has a cost. And I think the Christian world has forgotten the cost. I think we like being comfortable. We like coming on Sunday morning, sitting in our seats and going, what's the bare minimum I can do to follow Jesus? You see, we all count the cost for so many things, don't we? You know, I talk about schools. We have a couple school teachers over here right now. and They don't tell you everything when you go to become a school teacher. I mean, you walk in knowing you're not going to make a lot of money. You're never going to be a millionaire unless you invest a lot of money into something and you make tons of money that way. But when you go in, you, you know that there's going to be a lot of hours. You get summers, which those are getting shorter and shorter, and they cut into those too because you've got to prepare your room. But you count the cost for that. But I think when it comes to our Christian life, I'm going to be honest, we're lazy. I'm lazy. I get comfortable. We make excuses on why we can't do things. Oh, that's, that's not in my circle. That's not in my ability. That's not in my, what, my what's, the, what's the, that's not in my lane, or what's the phrase that that one, that's, my, that's not in my wheelhouse. I think that's why Jesus asked all these disciples the hard things, and I'm sure Philip would have been like, well, Jesus, talking to people and figuring out food, that's not in my wheelhouse, Jesus. Peter going and praying and the three disciples, hey guys, will you just pray with me for a couple hours? Peter could be like, Jesus, prayer, I could, I, could, I could go beat people up for you, I can catch fish, prayer, not in my wheelhouse, Jesus. I wonder how many of them would have used that same excuse that we use today. Some of you are like, Jeremiah, you're being so mean. I feel like I'm not. I prayed, I can't tell you how much I've prayed that I would be a loving father speaking truth not a mean brother. And I can't tell you how much the burden of this passage has been on me. Mark can tell you because he was in my office. This call that Jesus has for us to follow him, it's way bigger than what we think. And then Jesus says, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it.
whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? These are big questions. You see the next two questions there? The next one is, what does it profit to gain the whole world and lose your soul? Remember, you're like, Jeremiah, why are you speaking like this? This is, this is to followers. No, it's not. It's to a crowd of people. It's to a crowd. It's to just the group that's choosing to follow him, whether it's because they like the food he brought because he brought Chick-fil-A one day, or it's the people who have said, you know, we want to follow you. And now he's saying, here's the cost. You've heard this claim. I am the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Here is the cost to follow me. Here's what I'm going to pay. I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die. I'm not asking you to do any more than I'm doing. He says, but what does it gain a man? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world? And to forfeit or lose your soul. Ask yourself that. Because how many of us are trying to gain the world? We want to have enough money for later on so that we can invest, that we can retire. But you know what's so sad is when you start reading studies about people who do that and then they retire, they die so quickly. Because they lose all hope in life. When everything they've built was wrapped up in money. Jesus says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world? And lose your soul. And then he says, what would you give for your soul? There's, there's so many movies about people who gave up their soul for something, isn't there? I mean, I don't know them all. I didn't look into them all because usually they're pretty perverted. But you, you look at all these movies where people have given their soul so they might have riches, given their soul so they might have wealth, given their soul so they might have this or that or this. But we do that today. We give up our soul for love. We give up our soul for money. We give up our soul for success. We give up excuses. We give up our soul for having some kind of relationship or identity. Jesus says, but what does it gain because you lose it all in the end? This call to live is so much bigger than what we, I think we do. Jesus says at the end of verse 35, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. Jesus says, do you want to save your life? Do you want to live life to its fullest? Then lose it for my sake. Then don't live for your name. Don't live for your glory. That doesn't mean it's bad to make money. It doesn't mean it's bad to, to have a name. It doesn't mean that. But when it's all about you, or when that's all you're concerned about, when your life revolves around making sure you have all of this, then you know what, Jesus says, you, you've got what you want. But was it worth it? Was it worth it? Jesus says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulter adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. That's big. You know, I know there's some people in here that maybe you're thinking, Jeremiah, that this is, that's pretty, like, Jeremiah, th that's for people who are choosing to follow Jesus. That's for Christians. No, it's not. This is to a crowd just like us right now. There comes a moment where we have to decide, do I stand with Jesus or not? 
Am I going to choose to follow him? And the thing is, so many of us, we choose to follow him to a point. To a point of what's comfortable. Like when you hear us call out and when you hear us say, hey, we need help serving, and you're like, well, what do you need help with? We need kids at 9 o'clock. Oof. What time do I have to get here? That's pretty early. We choose to do what's comfortable. Because that fits our lifestyle. Jesus doesn't call us to comfortable. He calls us to radical. He calls us to different. But he didn't tell us any of that before he already said, I'm going to die for you. I'm going to suffer for you. I'm going to give up everything for you. Is Jesus worth it? You were worth it to him. You were worth it. When he was with his heavenly father, and God said, here's the cost of saving the world. You are going to suffer. You are going to be betrayed by one of your best friends. You are going to be beat and bruised and it's going to hurt because I'm not going to give you any numbing agent. I'm not going to, I'm not going to like put this ability to where you're going to have the shield around you. I'm not going to send angels to defend you. It's going to hurt. And then after you've gone through all that hurt, Jesus could read Isaiah 53. Jesus knew what his pain was going to be. Jesus knew what the cross cost. He knew that. And then God said, and Jesus said, after all that, you, then you die on a cross. But that's not the worst of it, God said. The worst of it is, I'm going to have to turn my back on you, my son. Can you imagine? I have kids. I love my kids. I can't imagine one day being like, I, you are so dirty and so full of sin that I have to turn my back on you. Can you imagine if your dad did some? Maybe some of you, your dad's done that. Your dad's walked out on you. Your dad has left you. Your, your dad has turned his back because he was disgraced or he felt like you didn't live up to some standards. That's not why God did it. God said, Jesus, the cost is... You have to carry the sin of the world. And that means I have to turn my back on you. But Jesus, that's also not the end. Because in three days after you die, you will have life again and the sins of the world will be forgiven. Jesus, will you count the cost? So when Jesus tells his disciples, here's the cost. When he, when he tells the crowd, the people who are choosing to follow, which we know many said, that's way too heavy for me. But we also know many said, let's do it. Let's go. I'm ready. Put me on the team. I'm ready to go. Let's do it. There were men and women who chose to. And when you look, the upper room at the end of Jesus' life was full of 120 people. It went from 12 to 120. Then went from 120 to over 3,000. And the crowd continued to go, you know what? I will follow. I'm going to dive in. That's why we have salvation today. Because a small group of 12 said, I will count the cost. I will choose to follow. I will count profit. Is my life to die that Jesus might live through me because of a small group that said, I choose to follow? We live in that cost that they counted. So I ask you, who is Jesus to you? 
Who is he? If he's just a good guy, then he's also a lunatic and a liar. And I'm sorry, but that's it. But if he's your Lord, if he's your Savior, then he says, this is the cost to follow me. He says, you've got to pick up your cross. So what is your cross? Is it serving? Is it giving? Is it putting others first? Is it thinking of your spouse more? Is it thinking of of your fellow employees and putting them first? I, I don't know what your cross is. Is it getting uncomfortable today? Is it going out of your comfort zone? Last week, the two people that gave their lives to the Lord A lady here at City View, after the service, she noticed they had two bags in their hands. And for some of you, that might, and I don't know if she was uncomfortable doing it or not. I I honestly don't know. I just know that she went up to him and she said, hey, let me introduce you to our pastor. She brought them up to me. She introduced them to me and then she said, hey, I want to take you over to our seven-minute party. And I I don't know whether or not that was comfortable or not. I know one of you, uh, Jimmy, last week or two weeks ago, uh, you were at a mechanic shop and two guys, somehow you got on a relation, uh, talk about Jesus and God and all of a sudden it came into where you, it was like thrown right at you like you invited these guys to church and I don't know how uncomfortable that was for you, I don't know what, but that's a cost. You are, you are counting a cost at that moment going, is Jesus worth an invite? Is Jesus worth sharing about? Is this worth my life? Am I going to take this next step or not? We all have to make that choice. What are we going to do? What are we, what are you going to do with Jesus? What is God asking you to do? And what does your cross look like? I can't decide that for you. You pick it up. For some of you counting the cost, it might be just your next step of going right over here and getting baptized this morning. That might be your next step. And you right now are having the internal battle on whether or not you are going to obey or not. It was funny. I was reading. I'm like, God, I just need some encouragement this morning. And I read a quick devotional in between just walking the campus this day. And and the whole devotion was about obedience, obeying God. And then we come in and the third song that we sang was all about obedience and obeying God. So your next step might be a step of obedience and saying, okay, God, I believe in you. And it's your next step here. If that's you, we have people over on the side right now. We have a change of clothes for you. We have a towel for you. We have everything you will need. Your next step might be going to the seven-minute party saying, okay, when's the next join the team? Your next step might be saying, you know what, God, I need to trust you with my money. I'm just going to start tithing and giving. For some people, your next step is saying, God, I know you're calling me to a bigger calling than just serving, but God, I think you're calling me into ministry. What does that look like? There might be somebody in here or a couple of you people in here that God's saying, I'm calling you to pastor a church. And you're like, I don't know what that looks like, Jeremiah, I don't know. I will help you. I will do whatever I can to see God move in you. I don't know what your next step is. I don't know what God is asking you to do. All I know is it's not going to be comfortable. But he's faithful. He will walk with you, never leave you, nor forsake you. Because Jesus died so that you might live. Heavenly Father, I 
even as I'm praying, if you are making that decision to get baptized right now and that's you and you're choosing whether you're going to obey or not, get up right now. We're all going to pray. So if you're worried about people watching you, get over that and just get up and go to the back over to your left. Just do that right now while I'm praying. So get up. I know there's somebody in here right now. I just, there's something in my spirit that says there's somebody in here that God's saying, your next step is this. If you choose to do it, there is good. I, I, Monty Williams, our coach, said, what you want is on the other side of hard. Man, that's so true. In all of our lives, what we want is on the other side of hard. It's never on the other side of easy. So if that's your next step, just get up right now and go, just go over there. Jesus, we're here. We, making this choice, Lord, I, I'll admit it's scary. It's intimidating. It's, we don't really know what it looks like because we, we, want, we would rather know Jesus. This is Jesus, you telling us this is the next three things. This is what it's going to look like to get uncomfortable. This is what it's really going to look like to follow. I mean, we, Jesus, we read it. You say, follow us, and we will have this prophet of eternal life. But, but what does it look like? Is, are, are we going to lose friends, or is it going to cost me a job, or am I going to have to take a pay cut, or Jesus, is it going to make it more uncomfortable for me at home, or am I going to have to be home a little more with my kids, or Jesus, what, we, we want to know all that. But Jesus, you're not telling us to know it all. You're telling us to trust you. So Jesus, I thank you that you trusted your father and that you died. And you trusted him and he rose you from the dead. Jesus, I thank you that you gave, you give us life. And Jesus, I ask that you would help us to follow you. Right now, we're going to take a second And there's some of you I'm going to ask you, who is Jesus to you? And today might be your day to choose to follow Jesus, meaning giving him your life for the first time. And I, I, I'm going to speak to you. And, and to those who've already chosen to follow Jesus, I want you to think, God, what is it you're calling me to? And just ask him. For those of you who have, you want to make that choice to follow Jesus for the first time, because that's what that crowd, the crowd had that option. Okay, am I going to choose to follow him today? Am I going to count the, top, the cost today? Am I going to surrender my will and my life? Am I going to trust him as Savior? Am I going to trust him as God? It doesn't mean you need to have it all figured out. As you've heard, this is the perfect place for imperfect people. We're all on a faith journey figuring out life together. So if that's you, if today you've come to that, that sort of fork in the road where you have to decide, am I going to follow Jesus or not? Is he just a good guy, meaning he's a liar and a lunatic, or is he Jesus, Savior, Lord, God? And if you're choosing to say he's Savior, Lord, and God, I say you pray with me. Just say, dear God, I believe in your Son. I believe that he died on a cross for me. I believe that he is going to give me life. And God, I ask that you would forgive me. God, I ask that you would set me free. God, I ask that you would make me new. God, help me follow you. If you prayed with me this morning, everybody's eyes are closed and heads are bowed. If you prayed with me this morning, would you raise your hand? I have a gift that I would love to give you. My team members are here, but if you pray with me, would you please raise your hand so I can give you that gift? Just keep your hands up so we can see them because I can't see a whole lot from up here. I have team members that are going to be walking around that have a gift for you. Jesus, we all are on this journey. So help us to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.